Hi, I'm Dirk Hoffmann-Becking from the History of the Germans podcast. And today I want to talk to you about Prague, about the transformation of this city under the king and emperor Charles IV, Karel IV, Karl IV, whichever way you want to call him. And in particular, I want to talk to you about the greatest infrastructure project of the Middle Ages, the creation of the Prague Newtown. So if you look on the uh, on the map on the right, what you see is sort of roughly the sizes of the uh, the city of Prague in 1330, which is sort of, you know, the old town, the lesser town, which is sort of on the other side of the Vitava, um, and then underneath Prague Castle. And then just at the bottom on the, uh, uh, you have Visegrad, which is uh, the other old uh, castle of the kings of Bohemia. So between 1347 and 1349, um, Charles IV uh, decides to build uh, the Prague new town. So he builds this wall that goes all the way from the bottom there, from the Visegrad castle, all the way to the uh, Vitava at the top within just two years. Um, and then um, organizes for the city to be filled in within a very brief period of time. Essentially, the population of Prague goes from about 15,000 plus minus to 40,000. It becomes the second largest or potentially the largest city um, in the empire with or more uh, uh, or, or, or slightly bigger than Cologne. And in terms of overall space, um, it is compatible, um, not quite compatible, but a little bit smaller than Constantinople or Rome. It is a huge, it's a huge thing. It's a huge undertaking. And so before we go into what this undertaking actually was and how he achieved it and what he wanted to achieve with it, um, we have to wind back a little bit. We have to wind back to the year 1344. Because in 1344, Prague becomes an archbishopric. Now that doesn't sound like an awful lot. So, you know, I've just read that last year Las Vegas became an archbishopric, a piece of information completely passed me by. I don't know whether you put particular um, uh, stakes into this particular event. But in the Middle Ages, becoming an archbishopric was a huge deal. Because the difference is a bishop reports to another archbishop. An archbishop only reports to the Pope. And to wind back a bit even further, so in the year 1000, the Emperor Otto III travels to Poland. It's a very famous journey. And one of the outcomes of this journey is that Gniezno uh, becomes a bishop, an uh, archbishopric. Uh, so instead of reporting to the Archbishop of Mainz, as it had done so far, the Bishop of Gnezno becomes an Archbishop and only reports to the Pope. And that was given the fact that the infrastructure, the administrative capabilities of the Church massively, massively exceeded that of um, any of the monarchies up until about the 15th and 16th century, maybe even longer, um, it meant that for the rulers of Poland, the Dukes and then later Kings of Poland, it was quite a bit easier to extract themselves out of the orbit of the empire because now they had an archbishop that had a direct relationship with the pope. Um, very similar thing in Hungary, maybe even more extreme. Hungary became it got its first archbishopric in 1001 in Estragon. Um, the kings of Hungary, who may have uh, um, been uh, in or were in the orbit of the empire, um, but they were able to very quickly extract themselves out of the clutches uh, of the uh, of the Ottonian rulers uh, and Salian rulers. So, um, having an archbishop uh, for your secular country or secular state um, is incredibly important because it gives you the chance um, to be more independent and to be more free. Now, if you look at the three monarchies to the east of the empire, Poland, Hungary, and Bohemia, Bohemia is the only one that didn't get an archbishop in the 10th century. It's also the only one that is still within the context of the Holy Roman Empire. And so therefore, when in 1344, Bohemia gets this archbishop for the very first time, it's a big deal. It is part of a recognition of Bohemia as part but still separate, somewhat slightly detached from the empire itself. And the guy who makes this happen is Charles IV. Um, at that point, he's the crown prince of Bohemia. 
His father, John the Blind, is still the king of Bohemia, but he has a very close relationship with Clement VI, the current pope in Avignon. Uh, Clement VI was his mentor. Um, this is a relationship that goes back to his very youth. You know, Charles IV grew up in Paris, and um, uh, he had uh, the uh, yeah, he had heard Clement VI preach in a church and was hugely taken by him and managed to essentially become one of his confidants. So Clement VI feels um, it is time that Prague now becomes an archbishopric basically because Charles the uh, Charles the fourth asks him uh, to do that the uh, the new archbishop is a man called Arnost of Pardubice um, he was a close re uh, advisor and friend of Karl the fourth now there is something quite unusual about um, the the archbishopric of Prague um, and it has to do you know, uh, uh, to a degree with the cathedral because if you look on this lovely picture of Prague and if you see where the cathedral is which is at the top right hand corner up on the hill now that is quite unusual because you know if you look at cathedral churches anywhere in uh, uh, in Western Europe whether that's you know um, in um, uh, in Magdeburg and Cologne in Mainz in Trier um, on the French side in Reims in um, in Paris uh, in Toulouse uh, in England in um, in Canterbury in York the cathedral is in the center of the town it is where the people live the cathedral of Prague is 30 minutes walk from the Tain Square, from the main square of the old town. And it's a half hour walk uphill. It's not, you know, it's not a convenient walk. Um, and that just speaks to, or is a, is a function of, the way the Bohemian Church has been created. The Bohemian Church came uh, about with uh, the good king St. Wenceslas in the 10th century. Wenceslas basically converted to Christianity. He came back to Bohemia. He brought with him a bishop um, and he started to Christianize his the, until then pagan peoples. So the bishop was very much sort of in the train of the temporal ruler, the dukes and then later kings of Bohemia. Um, and that kind of relationship stayed all the way through. The bishop would actually not reside in town. The bishop as church and the bishop's palace are within the precinct of the royal castle in this case if prague castle so the bishop and then later archbishop of prague had a lot less independence than you would find with many bishops and archbishops anywhere else in europe in jokingly charles the fourth at some point referred to the archbishop as his um his personal chaplain and so that also meant that the church, the cathedral you see, is a it's an archiepiscopal church and the archbishop paid for it. But it is also very much a church um, that the, um, the king and then emperor Charles IV uh, built um, and built as part of his plan for Prague. Now, um, because you know he had grown up in France, what he wanted was he wanted the finest, the greatest architect to build his great new archiepiscopal uh, cathedral and home chapel. Um, and that was a guy, he hired a guy called Matthias of Ara. Now, Matthias of Ara was a classically trained French architect. Uh, he comes from, as the name says, from Ara, which is in northern France. He might have basically apprenticed or done his first works on, you know, the great northern cathedrals that were rising up, Amiens and Beauvais, etc. Um but, you know, by the time he gets hired for St. Vitus in Prague, he works on the Papal Palace in Avignon. Again, one of these connections between Charles IV and the Pope. Uh, Charles IV asked for an architect. Uh, Clement VI sends him Matthias of Ara. Matthias of Ara basically designs the, the church. He creates the plans. Uh, he begins the building work. He is very much, as I said, a classically high Gothic architect. So it's all about lines and proportions and clarity. 
And so, you know, the church rises up so that, you know, the first bits are built, you know, while he's still alive. But in 1352, Matthias of Orad dies. Um, for the next four years, his successes continue with his plans. But in 1356, a new guy, a new architect is appointed for the project. And that guy is a guy called Peter Parler. Peter Parler was only 23 years old when he was given the uh, assignment to build St. Vitus's Cathedral. And Peter Parler was a different guy to Matthias. So he was more of a sculptor. He was a sculptor and an architect. Um, so the picture you see on the left is his uh, autoportrait uh, as a sculptor. Uh, he made multiple sculptures of Bohemian rulers uh, on St. Vitus Cathedral and, amongst other things, depicted himself. But by the age of 23, when he came to do this project, he only had sort of two projects under his belt. One was the Holy Cross Minster in Schwäbisch Gmünd and the Frauenkirche in Nürnberg. Both of those he did as uh, or under the guidance of his father, Hendrik Parler. And so um, Peter Parler essentially had worked with his father for his father all the way up until uh, that time. Um, he basically apprenticed with his father at the age of 19. He became a journeyman, as was common in the Middle Ages, and he traveled to all the basic major uh, uh, cathedral projects in Europe. He went to Cologne, he went to Strasbourg, he probably also went to England um, to learn new techniques, to learn what you know the masters uh, uh, elsewhere were doing. But by the you know, age 23, he came back to uh, his father's workshop and he worked on the Frauenkirche in Nuremberg. Now, the Frauenkirche in Nuremberg was a huge project at the time, a hugely prestigious project because it was a church that Charles IV, again, didn't pay for, uh, but inspired. It was supposed to become a church that played a major role in imperial processions, um, you know, in the presentation of the uh, the imperial regalia, etc., etc., and it was a key element of bringing Nuremberg to the table. It also has a bit of a dark backstory uh, because essentially um, underneath it lie the um, uh, the ruins of the uh, the Nuremberg synagogue, um, which was uh, part of uh, another story I told in the previous episode where the citizens of Nuremberg essentially wipe out uh, the largest Jewish community in uh, the empire at the time, in part because of the uh, the plague having arrived in, in 1349 and people, you know, uh, telling each other that the, the, the Jews have poisoned the wells. But it's more likely in this case that the citizens of Nuremberg wanted to get rid of the, uh, the Jews because they were competition um, and they also held the fillet pieces of uh, the town which is essentially where the Frauenkirche is. Sorry I digress. Anyway Peter Parler works on the Frauenkirche, Charles IV comes to visit, sees his work, is impressed, he needs a replacement for Matthias of Arras, the you know other architects who've been uh, uh, temporarily working on it, didn't quite take his fancy so he gets Peter to come to Prague and work on St. Vitus's Cathedral. And that is where St. Vitus's Cathedral becomes more than just another Gothic cathedral in the High Gothic style, because Peter Paula has his own style, his own ideas. Um, and he invents two very crucial elements of late Gothic architecture, one of which are the so-called Parler vaults. So if you look on the left-hand side, you've got Strasbourg Cathedral, built actually, you know, not much earlier than that. Um, and if you look at the vaults, so the um, uh, the ceilings, what you see is, you know, from each of the pillars, there's a rip that goes diagonally across to the pillar on the diagonally opposite side. And there's a pillar, uh, there's a rip going from the, you know, the, the pillar next to it, again, diagonally across. This is a way to make ceilings lighter, uh, more sturdy and higher. Um, Gothic cathedrals are all about height. You want to sort of raise people up to um, to the heavenly Jerusalem, um, and so they were already a great invention. But they've been around for you know well over a hundred years, and this is a key feature of Gothic architecture. Now, what Peter Parler comes up with is is a sort of radical rethinking of that. So instead of having just one rip going diagonally across, he has two rips going uh, uh, across, and then they basically create a sort of net pattern, a, a 
of intersections uh, in various shapes of of triangulars that again it makes this construction sturdier lighter uh, and more robust but it also creates a absolutely beautiful net effect um you know that you know is picked up by architects all across um uh, medieval europe you know within a very very uh, a brief period of time so st stephen's in vienna is already deeply in the parlor style um the you know this style basically percolates through uh, all of europe into Seville, into um, the English cathedrals. But the guy who invented it is this guy, Peter Parler, in, um, in Prague. That's one thing he did. The other thing that he's famous for is the balustrade. And again, it's a, it's a genius optical um, idea. So if you look on the left-hand side, you've got Strasbourg Cathedral, a classic Gothic cathedral. So the idea was you build the walls as high as you can, you know, basically, you know, if you look at the cathedral in Beauvais, it's absolutely astounding. It just goes on and on and on and on, um, 50 odd meters high. Um, but it's just it's just one wall. So um, there are no not much of an interception intersection. Um, what Parler came up with is this idea. OK, so if we put a put a very prominent balustrade between sort of the lower ray, uh, row of pillars and, and, and vaults, and the upper um, uh, section where all the you know the, um, uh, the 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 colored glass windows are, what actually happens is it 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 looks like and if you look on the right hand side you can see it in Saint Vitus Cathedral, as if there was a church floating above the lower church. It's a um, it's 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 as if the the heavenly Jerusalem is sort of flying above the congregation, as a um, a place sort of halfway between the earth and heaven, and again you know it is a it is an architectural device that's been picked up everywhere in Nuremberg in Landshut, um, uh, le, you know as far south as Seville. you know the Hanseatic cities in Scandinavia. You find this sort of you have to keep a you know look at it you know spend some time you know when you go to a gothic cathedral next time look for the parlor elements um it is it is quite a genius way of um devising a um a, 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 a gothic church so the parlors are a big deal um but the the most precious and most important chapel within uh st vitus's church is the St. Vance's Last Chapel, where you know you can see the you know the lovely rip vaults um, that that Parler produced here. Again, new innovative uh, structures. It is also incredibly well, you know, incredibly lusciously decorated. So if you look at the lower part, these are all semi-precious stones. Thirteen hundred of those been built in there. Within it, there's a the depiction of the Passion of Christ. Um, then the upper frescoes. These are a bit younger 16th century but there probably were 14th century frescoes there depicting the life of saint venceslas and saint venceslas you know holy you know good king saint venceslas the founder of the bohemian church the founder of the kingdom of bohemia in a way um he obviously gets a very uh, uh, uh luxurious chapel inside saint vitus's cathedral so far so normal but within this chapel there were two objects uh kept one was a bust reliquary of St. Venceslas. I've been trying to find out what actually was inside it. It might be that there was his skull, because his skull is still around. I've seen pictures of it. So maybe inside the reliquary was the skull. But basically, you know, if you have a bust reliquary, what it is is sort of, you know, it's the upper body with, with the head. Um, and this bust was commissioned by Charles IV and the other thing he commissioned was the crown of St. Venceslas which is this thing um, quite a lot of serious bling on this um, pretty expensive you know Charles IV is always short of money but he's got money to make this or to have this made now this crown is then put on the head of that bust of St. Venceslas and put into the chapel of St. Venceslas. And that is quite unusual. 
So crowns, um, medieval crowns at the time, weren't displayed to the public in some sort of place you can go and, and have a look at them. Um, they were the private property of the monarch. So the monarch would typically keep them in his most fortified castle. He would take it out, you know, if he has a diet or parliament or whatever and, you know, has to represent the monarchy. He would basically walk under the crown. He would get himself a bishop or some other dignitary holding the crown over his head as he's walking or, or sitting down. Um, in the same way as, you know, if you see Charles III, uh, King of England, um, oh, King of uh, uh, England, Scotland, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the opening of Parliament, that's where he wears the crown. He doesn't wear the crown very often other than, than these events. So that's what they're for. Um, you could pawn the crown. You know, we have several incidents where, for example, Edward III of England is pawning the crown to the Hanseatic merchants. So it's the private property of the king. Now, this thing sitting is called the crown of St. Wenceslas, and it's actually on the head of the actual St. Wenceslas in the St. Wenceslas chapel. This is no longer the private property of Charles IV. This is essentially the king's crown. Um, at which point the question is, why did Charles IV commission a very, very expensive item uh, to be produced that is not his, that he can't pawn if that's what he needs to do with it, or um, that he can only take out of St. Vincent's last chapel in a sort of rather complicated um, uh, uh, process. Essentially, it's only taken out uh, in case of a coronation or in case of um, particularly high religious festivals. And weirdly, this is still the case today. So um, if you look at this, um, the the crown of St. Wenceslas is kept in a room next to St. Wenceslas Chapel. Um, still today, it is this this um, treasury is locked, has seven locks, and each of these locks has a different key. So there are seven dignitaries who have the keys to the lock, the President of the Republic, the Speaker of the House, the Archbishop of Prague, and a couple of other people um and only when all seven are present and all seven turn the keys can the crown be um taken out and it is taken out only on very very special occasions um i think sort of you know inauguration of a new president or uh in 2016 when you know there was the uh, 700th anniversary of charles the sixth uh, charles the fourth etc etc so this crown is still quite uh, uh, important and you know most other crowns are in museums this crown is the only crown as far as I know um, that is not on public display in a museum but in the place that it was supposed to be held because this crown is more than just a physical object um, what Charles did here is he basically turned this physical object into a political object to understand what I mean here is you have to go back again. You know, Charles's rule over Bohemia was fragile um, almost all the way through, but particularly in the beginning, because you know the Luxembourg, so the family of Charles IV, had only become kings of Bohemia with his father, and his father only became king of Bohemia because he married the um, the daughter of one of the last Premislid kings, um, the dynasty that had ruled Bohemia for. I think about 300 and some years. So the um, this position as King of Bohemia was built largely on the consent of the barons. Essentially what happened was there was a previous guy that was King of Bohemia that the barons of Bohemia didn't like and so they decided to throw him out and ask um, the then Emperor Henry VII to give him their son uh, who was John of Bohemia, to become their king. Um, but essentially, the bo the barons were running the place. Um, and King John of Bohemia basically rarely, so Charles's father rarely came to Bohemia. He hated the place um, because it was massively unpopular. And he only came basically to say, you know, can you give me some money so I can go out and, you know, do more tournaments and fighting and stuff. Um, now, Charles had a much closer relationship with Bohemia, uh, probably in part because he hated his father and that was his way to sort of find a place where his father couldn't really get at, get at him. He learned the language. He was quite 
linguistically capable. Um, and he always emphasized his descent from his mother, the you know, and therefore his descent from the great premise lit kings, the Autocars uh, and Wenceslas uh, of the past. But that in itself, you know, that's a nice way, you know, to improve your profile. But is this really enough to, to, you know, put your rule over Bohemia onto a solid footing? And so, what he thought of, and I'm, and I think he's a he's one of the political geniuses of the 14th century, was to say, well, I, you know, I can try to sort of convey all of, you know, the. Um, um, the splendor, the importance of Bohemia onto my person, but that will run into difficulties because I'm the son of the foreign king. Um, but what I can do is I can basically create an object that then incorporates Bohemia, its customs, its people, its rights, its privileges, all that. So essentially, he created this crown of Bohemia, this object here, as a political, as a, as a as a manifestation of a political thing. And he goes so far, so he's now not just king of Bohemia, he's also become um, king of the Romans, and therefore future emperor. And so what he can do is he basically takes his fiefs, so he has personally uh, fiefs in Silesia, um, on the western side of Bohemia, areas that traditionally weren't part of Bohemia. And in his role as emperor, um, or future emperor, he basically moves them from his fiefdom into, you know, makes them fiefs and integral parts of the kingdom of Bohemia, of the crown of Bohemia. So the crown of Bohemia becomes essentially the overlord of these lands. Um, and so having, you know, being crowned with the crown of St. Wenceslas is what gives you the right over the lands not necessarily the fact that you've been descendant of x or who uh, but the fact that you are the rightful holder of the crown of saint wenceslas and so by creating this sort of image which he actually creates before he's even crowned you know so the crown is actually produced in 1344 two years before he is crowned king of bohemia um but he already has this plan. He also basically then backs up this plan by having a coronation ceremony that then legitimizes the fact that he is wearing the crown of St. Wenceslas and therefore is the ruler of Bohemia. And that coronation service is interesting in many respects. So the first important part of it is he is crowned by a Bohemian archbishop. All previous Bohemian kings been crowned by the Archbishop of Mainz, who is a German, you know, we are not yet in the sort of nationalistic period where, you know, there's a difference, there's a fundamental difference between Czechs and Germans, but it is already emerging. We are, you know, and within 50 years, there'll be a lot of Ch Czech nationalism, whatever, we'll get to it and define it closer what it is. But it is important for the Bohemians, given they are part of the empire, which is dominated by German speaking peoples, to have a recognition as Czechs and their, their their language. So the coronation ceremony, which involves the anointing, which elevates him to a sacred status that gives him the crown, but also includes um, as one of the major hymns, the Kyrie Eleison, uh, and that Kyrie Eleison is sung in Czech. And that's part of what um, uh, Charles uh, deliberately put in here, because what it basically then says to the barons, but also to the people and the you know the city citizens of Prague, is that their king is a Czech king, a Bohemian king. He's not a foreigner who's sort of flown in, um, but he is part of um, this land. And because he's part of this land, um, he is allowed to carry the crown of Saint Wenceslas. It's a le he's legally permitted to carry the crown of St. Wenceslas, which then gives him all the rights over all of Bohemia. Um, and that is, you know, again, something completely new. That'll be, you know, we will see next episodes when we talk about how he deals with the crowns that he then acquires, in particular the imperial crown, how he that also elevates to a, uh, 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 or tries to elevate to, to, a, to a, a political object. Um, but what we do in this episode, which I'm not going to go through now, um, is 
you know, so he's got the crown of St. Wenceslas, the crown of Bohemia. He is the real king of Bohemia. What he now needs is a, is a capital. And so that's when we're going to talk about how the whole construction of um, the Prague new town takes place. Uh, we're going to talk about you know, the one thing that, you know, you are, uh, um, if you've ever been to Prague, you almost certainly have seen and been on, which is the Charles Bridge which to my mind is still the most beautiful bridge in Europe, uh, despite, you know, masses of tourists, tit-tat sellers and drunk teenagers and all that. Forget it. It is one of the most beautiful bridges, um, both in terms of location, the towers on both ends, uh, the, the elegance of the design, um, bar none. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the squares, which are, again, enormous and, 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 and a fascinating uh, topic. But then what we're then going to talk about also is how does this then, how does he then tr try to translate all this into political power? Because all of these designs, the St. Vitus Cathedral, the Crown of Bohemia, uh, the Crown of St. Wenceslas, the, you know, the squares, the, um, uh, the Charles Bridge, all that is there for a purpose. And he's trying to bring this into a political reality in 1355. And, um, we will talk about this in this episode, how this works. So if you want to hear this, go to episode 158, History of the Germans podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, practically any other um, a podcast you want to uh, go to. You can go to my website, historyofthegermans.com, uh, or you can use that QR code. Unfortunately, this is just an Apple QR code. I can't find a Spotify or any other QR code, but I, you know, I'll be trying to find this sort of stuff uh, that will take you straight to the um, the show. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you will enjoy the actual audio podcast, um, which is also available on YouTube, by the way. Forgot about that. Um, and please leave me some comments. Um, also critical comments. You know, I'm new to YouTube. This is all very weird. I'm far too old for this thing. Um, but, you know, I'll try. Um, so if there's things you like, things you don't like, um, things I should do differently, let me know um, so that, you know, I get to a point where I can produce content that you really enjoy um, and that I enjoy uh, making. Um, so hope to see you at the History of the Germans podcast. Bye.